Okay, we are. So, um, thank you for joining us today. And um, just some housekeeping things first. Um, please mute yourselves, everybody. Um, so we can only hear Carolyn speaking and not the dogs be barking behind you. Um, and um, at question time, um, raise your hands if you want to um, ask a question. Um, and also, if you could put it on, on uh, if you go to view on your screen and put it on speaker view, you will get a, a larger view of the speaker at the time and not uh, a small picture with everything else, everyone else. I am recording it today and it will be on our website. Um, and now I think after that, um, we've got people joining us today from Wales, across North America, and I think from Liverpool in England, that is great. Um, so um, Welsh Food Stories explores 2000 years of history to discover the rich but forgotten heritage of Welsh foods from oysters to cider, salted butter to salt marsh lamb. Ancient traditions have survived in pockets across the country despite industrialization, and Welsh foods are being taken back to their roots by farmers, bakers, and fisher folk. They are trailblazers. Author Carrowing Graves with us today is also the author of Apples of Wales, and he was instrumental in establishing the national collection of Welsh varieties at the National Botanical Garden of Wales another subject for another day maybe. He is passionate about local food flavors of all sorts and lives in Carmarthen, Wales with his family and a growing vegetable garden. Welcome, Carwin. Thank you, Jeff and Laura. Great, do you want me to um, make a start then? Yeah, brilliant, good. Okay, well, um, lovely to be, um, here with you all um, uh, in the sense that we can be together uh, virtually. Um, yeah, I'm speaking to you. It's the sun has set here, as you all know. And it's uh, dark. I'm speaking to you from uh, Carmarthen in southwest Wales. And I was telling, I gather there's an interest in genealogy amongst you. I was telling Susan that um, uh, on the ancestry side, um, uh, it's all South Wales, entirely Huntu um, for me from Pembrokeshire across to Cardiff, um, uh, but nothing even in the middle, let alone north. Um, so uh, please forgive me uh, for that. Um, but it's good to be with you. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, what I'm gonna do is run through um, uh, a bit of a, um, uh, a presentation. It's gonna be based on the book, um, but I'm not going to try and compress everything that's in the book um, uh, into what a brief 40 minutes. Um, so uh, I'll, um, I will give it a shameless plug um, at the end because um, there's so much you could possibly cover um, in the time that we've got. That we've got. Um, I'll, um, uh, we, we've got time for questions at the end as well. And I'd love to hear your own memories. A few people were sharing just a moment ago about their family food traditions. Um, so that would be lovely um, to, to have a bit of a discussion around that at the end. Um, and um, the other thing that I wanted to say was, um, and I can't remember now. Um, it'll come. Oh yeah, I've been, I've been, uh, I've made, I had a request to uh, read some short sections of the book as well. So I don't normally do that. Um, I've only once had a request to do that. I do talk quite frequently, but people don't seem to want readings these days. Um, so I will do um, <clears throat> one or two short readings as well from the book. Um, Great. I'm going to share my screen um, because I think you're more interested in what I have to say than in my face. So I'm going to share my screen, and I've given I've given the um, really presentation um, uh, this little title here: "Lamb and Leeks: uh, A New Look at Welsh Food." Um, if you know anything about Wales, actually, um, then you probably have heard um, the stereotype of sheep. Um, and uh, similarly, um, the place of leeks within kind of Welsh national symbolism. We'll come back to um, both of those um, a little bit later on. But there's a lot more to Welsh food than just lamb and leeks. Um, and we'll go into a bit of that today. Uh, as was mentioned, um, this book um, available in English and Welsh. I hope this is also available in North America. I didn't check. Apples of Wales. 
Um, I'll just say briefly about this. That when this came out in 2018, it was the first book to be published in either language, Welsh or English, that touched even on the whole rich heritage of orchards, cider making, um, uh, and apples, apple varieties and everything in Wales. And it was very interesting because until we did the research and the book came out, um, you could ask Welsh historians, and I did this, about the topic, and they would say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't think I know anything about it. In other words, it was as though it had never happened. And you had statements in print saying things like that Wales has no fruit heritage um, because the soil and the climate isn't suitable, which is absolute, you know, I don't want to use a rude word, absolute nonsense. Um, and uh, I was going to say a word beginning with B, but there you go. Um, absolute nonsense. Um, and uh, there's something interesting about history and how history can so easily be forgotten. Um, uh, if we're not careful. Uh, and then this book, um, Welsh Food Stories, came out um, uh, just earlier um, in uh, summer 2022. Um, it has been very kindly received. Um, I heard uh, a couple of weeks ago that it was, um, uh, it had been um, kind of awarded the best food policy book of the year across the UK on BBC Radio 4, which was um, a very nice surprise um, indeed. Um, so um, apparently it's a food policy book. Um, it's not a travel log, um, I'll tell you that. Um, and uh, I suppose you can decide for yourself exactly what it is. It's a book about food um, and uh, food past and food present uh, and how food culture really matters. Um, that's how I'd sum it up and what I try to write there. So we'll, um, we'll, we'll dive into some of, um, of what the book has to offer. I'll just draw to your attention as well. That's the cover. Um, and um, I very, very deliberately set out to disappoint people by not putting a leak on the cover. And there isn't lamb on the cover either, dead or alive. Um, uh, so that was entirely deliberate. The things that are on the cover are in the book. Um, I didn't paint it. The artist um, did a wonderful job, um, uh, Elise. Um, you'll find the details, I think, just inside um, the book. She did a wonderful job. Great. So we're going to going to go after um, a few topics around Welsh food culture. Look at some specific foods. Um, uh, touch on this big question briefly at the end: Why food history even matters? Why is this not the kind of arcane, academic exercise? Why is it something a bit more than that? Um, and then we'll come to questions, as I said. Um, I'm going to get you um, working, get you thinking, get your brain cogs turning for a minute at the beginning here. What percentage? of Wales's current workforce, do you think is employed in agriculture? Um, anybody who is willing to hazard a guess, just unmute yourself and shout out. 70%. 70%. Down, down from 70%. 20%. Susan. I'd say less, less than a third. Less than a third, yeah, keep going down. 10%. 10%. Keep going down. Oh, no. Hmm. Somebody? Keep going five. down from 10. Five. Five, yeah, five, is, five. five is almost right. Yeah, great. Wow. Good. Okay, hold it there. So the answer is 4%. 4%. And, uh, but that is compared with the US figure, which is 1%. And the figure for England, just next door, also 1%. So 4% actually within the West is quite high. And a really interesting thing about this is that the Welsh, somebody said 25%. The Welsh figure got to 25% in, oh, I'm going to get the date wrong now, but it's something in the region of 1850, 1860, that kind of ballpark, a very long time ago, because Wales was the first fully industrialized society. So less than half of the, of the workforce in agriculture. That happened in Wales before anywhere else in the world. Um, and uh, so that obviously has a massive impact um, on food. So we'll come back to that. Next question. Um, how much of Wales is food um, before roughly the year 1900 was organic? Anybody? All of it. All of it, you're well-educated people, um, indeed, and not just in Wales, but of course, um, across the world. 
non-organic um, food, pe fertilizers, pesticides, all these things that make food non-organic um, came in, um, well, in Wales, at least in the mid 20th century, it started your side of the pond a bit earlier, but in Wales, it only really started after the Second World War. Um, so yes, it was all organic. Um, this next question, uh, I've put it very specifically there. Um, this is just for fun, really. How many tons of cockles? I'd better stop there. Do you know what cockles are? Cockles are little shellfish um, that uh, live in the sand. Um, and um, they're not obviously unique to the British Isles, but they are particularly prolific um, here. How many tons of cockles uh, were exported from Wales just from the one fishery of Deeside um, uh, per year? A ton is a lot of cockles. Cockles are very small. Um, five. Susan. Five. Susan's saying minus, five. Minus all the ones that I raked up in Red Wharf Bay. Yeah, so here you go. Here's the answer. Oh. 500. Um, 500 tonnes from Deeside alone. And Deeside is only the third largest cockle fishery in Wales. The largest, uh, not far from where I live in the southwest, um, exports something in the region of six to 7,000 tonnes. Um, and we'll come back to that again um, in, in um, probably 15 minutes or so. The final one, this is another little trick question, really. But how many traditional varieties of wheat did we have in Wales? There's a term for this, it's land race, um, if you know anything about the topic. But how many traditional varieties of wheat do you think we had? Anybody? Dig, 10. Dig, 10. Um, it's a good guess. Um, the actual answer is that it was, um, the number is, innumerable and this again is not something that's unique to Wales so there is a unique aspect to it so if you think in pre-industrial agriculture if you've got your farmers wherever in the world and they're sowing a field of grain wheat or oats or whatever that grain grows and you harvest it and you keep a percentage back to sow next year and the ones that are best adapted to the soil and to the climate in that farm are the ones that will do best and so will produce the food for next year. So every year, there's a little bit of natural variability. This is Charles Darwin. This is all that stuff that happens. Um, and so on every single farm that does this, the varieties change and they're ever so slightly different to each other. Um, now, this happened, of course, across the world. It stopped. Um, in different places and at different times. It's not how farming is done in the whole of the Western world today, neither in Wales, nor in France, nor in Australia, nor in the US, apart from some exceptions. There are some old men, generally, um, in Wales who, um, who have carried on doing this, even to the present day. Not many, just a few. Um, and with wheat, um, they, they didn't carry on with wheat, they carried on with oats, um, but um, with wheat, um, the traditional varieties died out in England in the 1850s. The traditional varieties um, died out in Wales in the 1950s and 1960s, and then they were conserved by some of the universities and they're coming back now. Um, so we were a, a hundred years um, longer in keeping some of these traditions going with um, grains. Anyway, um, that's all to get you thinking um, about food. Um, how about this topic then, Welsh food culture? I don't know about you, and I don't know um, how many of you, some of you maybe have never been to Wales. I take it you all, you all have Welsh ancestry or some kind of strong interest in Wales, at least if you've never even been here. But if you know anything about Wales, food probably isn't the first thing that comes to mind, and there is a good reason for that. Whereas if you think about some other parts of Europe, maybe Spain or Italy um, or France, people go on holiday to these places and food is always at the top of the list when you talk about food culture. Well, is it fair, is it historically accurate to talk about a Welsh food culture? I think it is. And I'm going to try and convince you of the same in the next um, 15 minutes. And I do a lot in much greater detail in the book. Um, this picture. Can you see the little, um, I'm going to annotate the screen. Can you see this little tiny man off the cliffs um, in South Wales? So this, this is a picture, um, a painting that was made um, in the 1700s. And that little guy is abseiling and he's going after Carwr Moor, which is the Welsh for 
um, samphire. I don't know if you've ever tasted samphire, but it grows wild along the cliffs here. It may do in North America as well. I have no idea about North American ecology, but it's, um, it's, you can buy it in supermarkets these days here, but it's very expensive. Um, people had to taste for it um, that back in that era. Um, and in that part of South Wales, um, it was very much served on peasant plates, you know, little people in the countryside. Um, they'd go after marsh samphire and other sort of rare plants. Um, now, if you are hungry, if you're starving, marsh samphire is not going to make, you know, not, not going to help you an awful lot. It's tasty, it's nutritious, it doesn't fill your belly. So the fact that this guy is going after marsh samphire starts telling us something about people's interest in food and in searching out flavours um, in Wales historically. Um, I don't know if in your families and in what you know about, about Wales and Welsh culture, some of these kind of ring a bell. Um, my, my slides are bilingual, by the way, I should have said that at the start. Um, that's deliberate. Um, some of you speak Welsh and some of you probably learning Welsh. So I, I always do bilingual slides if I'm doing an English talk. Um, but so cultural memories, um, uh, home baking. There is a massive tradition of home baking in Wales, of all sorts of things. Baking on the griddle or the bake stone, um, which um, has survived here um, into the present because of Welsh cakes. That used to be so much more than just Welsh cakes. Again, within living memory. Um, uh, baking bread, baking... Um, and I, I'm just going to say one thing about baking here. Um, in Europe, I don't know about North America, but in Europe, um, in the last few years, Scandinavian baking has become very popular. Different recipes from Scandinavia using cinnamon and so on. And it strikes me that we're due a Welsh baking revival because there are all sorts of interesting recipes using different spices, nutmeg and caraway and all these sorts of things um, associated sometimes with different days in the year. Um, many of these recipes have died out, um, but there are, there are, they were a living part of our tradition and as I say, they're within living memory still, even though some of them are not made very much. Buttermilk is another one. Now, in the supermarkets here, you can buy buttermilk. It's not the real thing. When I talk to um, audiences in the countryside where I live, in Carmarthenshire, everybody grew up on buttermilk until the late 60s or the 70s. Um, this is a fermented drink. Uh, we know now about the gut health benefits of, um, of fermented um, foods and drinks. And um, there's a lot of folk tradition in Wales around um, the health benefits of buttermilk and other fermented drinks. Now we know why. Um, but buttermilk was ubiquitous, used in baking, um, used poured over new potatoes, so early season new potatoes, um, and used in many other ways as well. Prolifically used. Similar tradition existed, by the way, in Ireland um, and in parts of the west of England. This is an interesting one. Shawnee Winons. Has anybody ever heard of Shawnee Winons or Johnny Onion? Can you put your hand up if you've heard of, of Shawnee Winons, Johnny Onion? A few people have. So these are onion sellers that come over, it still happens, they come over from Brittany in France to um, the UK in general, but to Wales in particular. A lot more came to Wales than, than other parts of the UK and for a lot longer. Um, and they came to sell onions, a particular variety, a very sweet onion that keeps very well. Now, this still happens um, every year, and it's gone on since 1822, 200 years, with um, only a couple of interruptions from the First Second World War and then the lockdowns in the COVID pandemic. Um, why? Was there rural poverty in Wales in the 19th century and in the 20th century? Well, yes. Um, how did, why did people spend their hard-earned pennies on these onions from Brittany? Why was it worthwhile for the onion sellers to come over here? Did people grow onions in their gardens in Wales? Yes. So why did they spend their pennies on Breton onions? Well, the short and simple answer, corroborated by a lot of interviews I've done and all the reading I've done on this topic, is that people were willing to spend good money on good quality food. The onions are tastier than what you can grow here. They're a particular variety, they keep particularly well, they're sweeter. Um, and, um, and the chefs in Wales, and who were these chefs? Well, they were all women, of course. Um, uh, the, you know, the people doing the cooking 
thought it worthwhile to spend hard-earned pennies on quality when it came to onions enough to um to create a you know a livelihood for um you know dozens and dozens of um, onion men who spent half their year going door to door around the country on their bikes selling onions uh, and finally cockles that we've mentioned this is not a dead tradition by any means neither is the um uh, johnny johnny winnells um uh cockles are still gathered by hand and we'll come back to that i'll show you a little picture if um, I don't go too slowly. <laughs> um, uh, but cockles um, uh, are eaten, um, they're fried with onions and they're fried with bacon, a bit of salt, a bit of pepper, and then um, sometimes with eggs as well, and then served on toast. And that is a very common um, dish, um, still eaten by um, uh, enormous number of people over the age of about 50. Um, and I'm on a bit of a campaign to get people my age, I'm 30. Um, so you know everything about me now. Um, but to get people who are younger um, uh, to to kind of latch on to this fantastic tradition, because as we saw earlier, most of the cockles now caught in Wales go to Spain. They've got a they know what a good thing we've got here, um, but we are starting to lose sight of it, which is one of the many reasons I uh, thought the book needed to be written. And the final one is um, this tradition of tear cattle. I don't know if this idea of a chapel tea. Um, means anything to you, but what it is is a um, a chapel. I take it you know what a Welsh chapel is. Um, uh, always has its collection of um, crockery of china, fine china for tea, um, served then with baked goods, with Welsh cakes and arabrif um, uh, and other things. And people get together um, uh, after a service or a gaman vagani. Um, this is a, a sort of hymn singing festival um, or a range of other activities actually. Um, and I can testify this tradition um, is nowhere near as dominant as it would have been decades ago, but it's still very much alive and well. Um, and uh, I was at one just before Christmas. Um, so it very much um, carried on. Now, in Wales, the idea that this is something interesting, cultural, is laughed at. I show some of these slides, not all of them, but some of them to um, audiences here. And they look at me quizzically. And I say to them, have you never, you know, uh, do you not know what happens in other countries in the world? All of these things, none of them by itself is unique, but the combination together, you'll only find it in Wales. Um, and that is absolutely true of the chapel tea. And um, the elements of that found in other places, of course there are. But the, 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 whole, the whole package um, is a very Welsh thing. So these are just some of the things I'm hoping will ring a bell with some of you, will chime with some of your memories or, or your experiences. Um, but um, actually, if we wanted to, we could draw a much longer list, um, and you'll see this um, in the book. But some of the real elements of this um, uh, of this food culture that um, we inherited in Wales um, in the middle of the 20th century, and elements of which have survived to the present, include oats. Include um, a lot to say about oats, and no time to say it now, but a lot about oats. Um, include a very um, rich culture of using dairy products um, cheese not just cow's cheese but sheep's cheese as well and i'm glad to say there are some fantastic cheese makers bringing back welsh ewes you know sheep's cheeses um, milk of course um, you know we drink a lot of milk here people don't realize just how much it is compared to other countries uh, and the buttermilk i mentioned um, alcoholic drinks including cider um, including drinks that we've died out um, uh, by the beginning of the 20th century, but a well due revival. Mather Glyn is one. Diod Griavol is another. Diod Griavol is a drink made from the berries of the mountain ash tree. Again, I don't know if that tree even exists in North America, um, but it grows wild here um, on, the, on the hills and in the mountains, and it makes a very nice um, uh, fruity um, alcoholic drink. And then seafood, um, a seafood tradition that is very varied, including not just shellfish um, and lava, lava bread, which is seaweed, um, but also um, uh, smoked herrings um, and many other things too that I'm not going to list. And then cowl. I hope you all know what cowl is. If you don't know what cowl is, please write down that word, C-A-W-L, go away, Google it, and try and find the ingredients to make it. Um, because cowl is absolutely deeply woven into the thread of Welsh culture. Um, it is a kind of stew um, related to um, Irish stew, 
and an English dish called Lancashire hot pot. Um, but it's very much its own thing, um, with uh, one of the key ingredients being leeks, of course. Um, these days, interestingly, if you go and want to eat out and have cow in a restaurant, a cafe or a pub in Wales, you will usually be served lamb cow. That is a travesty. Um, lamb was never put in cow traditionally. Um, and I can still, you know, I, I spoke to a farmer just in the autumn who laughed and said, yes, isn't it funny how they all serve lamb cow? Nobody um, used to make lamb cow. Cow should be made using um, uh, ham from your home pigs or, um, you know, something like beef brisket um, uh, and mutton. You could add to that as well, um, but uh, not lamb. But that's the way with food. Um, a living tradition will change um, and that's completely OK. So if we have this very, very, very interesting, um, fairly unique combination of foods here, um, how come nobody knows about it? <laughs> how come it's um, even in Wales quite hard to get, um, you know, really good quality Welsh dishes on a restaurant menu? Uh, easier to eat out and eat something Italian than eat something Welsh um, in Wales. Well, we could go right back to um, the era of someone called Gerald of Wales, Gareth um, uh, But really what we're talking about here is um, perceptions. Perceptions of people from inside and outside. Gerald of Wales said in 1280, that almost all the population, that is the Welsh, live on its flocks and on oats, cheese and butter. But then in the very same work, he goes on to talk about orchards and vineyards in multiple locations around Wales. So maybe he's got a bit of an agenda here. Maybe we can't just take his word for it when it comes to the Welsh's food habits. If we move on through time, um, we can see other um, people from outside of Wales coming in um, and uh, describing what these sort of interesting indigenous people, um, uh, you know, what their food traditions are. Um, from people from Germany, people from France, travellers from England as well. I'll not read the one from Alan Cliff, but I will read this one from Thomas Steinle. This is in 1684, um, and, um, and he wants to see what these um, strange Welsh people do. And um, this is what he writes. He goes to Cardigan in West Wales, and he says, They have choice wine also of their own growth off the mountains, which the Welsh gentlewomen make of raspberries, and which abound in these plants. Hmm. Okay, but wait a moment. Have you been to Cardigan? There's no mountains about Cardigan. What's going on here? Wine, choice wine. But this is in the 1680s, if you know anything about history. This was the era called the Little Ice Age. The River, the river Thames froze over. Wales wasn't suitable for winemaking in 1684. And then raspberries, wine from raspberries. Well, maybe some of you know what that is. What we have here is a tradition that he didn't know anything about, um, uh, wasn't able to compute, is trying to understand. It's a, it's a native tradition of basically making fruit wines. Um, Thomas Dinley, the um, cosmopolitan English traveler, um, uh, you know, doesn't know what category to put it in. So he tries to describe it. It's something exotic and foreign um, food, you know, tradition that, um, that he just, the only way he can understand it is, is as being foreign and exotic. Um, and so, so he does. And then um, let me read um, from the book. Um, uh, then of course we have leeks um, uh, and uh, there's lots of things to say about leeks, but um, let me read um, something from the book here. This is page um, 197, the chapter about um, leeks. The leek status as emblematic of Wales is no recent fancy. Its use as a national symbol of sorts by the Welsh extends back to the post-Roman period. This era was foundational in the, in the development of Welsh language and identity, and a significant proportion of the records that do survive from this era are to do with the early saints, travelling Christian missionaries. Among these was one St. David, very sent, whose feast day of March the 1st has become, has become Wales's national day and is also Wales's old leek-wearing day. 
Maybe some of you are familiar with this. This custom was already in evidence by the early 17th century. As an anonymous ballad explains, for the perhaps bemused folk east of Offa's Dyke, that means in England, over the border. So this is the ballad. I'm not going to sing it. For our Englishmen, St. George, St. Andrew for the Scots, St. Patrick for Ireland, St. David, Welshmen's lot. In honour of which saint those countrymen do seek, for to remember the same day in wearing of a leek. Um, and so it goes on. Um, there's several more pages on, on how the leek became um, a tradition of Wales. But the thing I want to just draw your attention to um, here is, um, you know, that ballad shows it perfectly. You've got all these different um, saints um, across the British Isles, all fine, but the Welsh are particularly strange because they associate their saint with a vegetable and then they wear that vegetable on the saint's day. Trust me, I've looked into this. There is no comparable tradition. If you look at, if you, you can even Google, you know, um, uh, national vegetables, very few countries around the world have a national vegetable. Um, and uh, in the ones that do, um, that vegetable doesn't have anywhere near the kind of symbolism and relevance that um, the leek does in Wales. So the leek comes to stand very clearly for Welshness as a whole. It's a vegetable, it's food, again, and it comes to stand for Welshness. And the other thing, um, and the final example I want to give you here is one that was mentioned earlier um, uh, when people were chatting, um, uh, roast cheese. Now we don't normally call it roast cheese, we call it Welsh rabbit in English. Um, but it is um, roast cheese, that's the translation of um, cows bobby, which is the, the, the original Welsh term for it. It absolutely is Wel Welsh. If you read some books about history and food and about, um, you know, these things, um, you will sometimes find people saying, oh, well, Welsh ribbit isn't really Welsh. Absolute nonsense. Um, it absolutely is Welsh. Um, and it's been around uh, and associated with Wales as a particularly strange Welsh tradition originally. Um, hence why it got called Welsh a little bit, um, for um, uh, over 500 years. Um, we know this, um, and I go into more detail on this, but we can be very, you know, really quite certain about this because other countries during this period, so the Shakespearean period, and then later the um, era coming up to the sort of Pilgrim Fathers era in, in terms of the States, um, in other countries in Europe, um, cheese was a, a low status food and nobody cooked it apart from people in the Alps. So what's the famous tradition about roasting cheese in the Alps? Well, it's Swiss fondue and also raclette, if you've come across raclette, melted cheese. Um, but you go back a few hundred years, these were the areas that people did it. Basically, hilly Wales and mountainous Alps. Um, a, a few areas of mountainous France as well, outside the Alps, um, but um, otherwise um, not. Um, and so um, uh, there's a fantastic um, uh, anecdote written um, by a guy in England who died in 1549. So we don't know exactly when he wrote this, but it was before 1549. It is written among old jests, old jokes, how God made St. Peter porter of heaven. And at one time, there was in heaven a great company of Welshmen, which with their babbling troubled all the others. And so God said to, said to St. Peter that he was weary of them, and he would love to have them out of heaven. To this, St. Peter said, good Lord, I warrant you, that shall shortly be done. Wherefore, St. Peter went outside of heaven's gates and cried with a loud voice, Cows, Bobby, Cows, Bobby. That is as much to say, roasted cheese. Upon hearing this, the Welshmen ran out of heaven at a great pace. And when St. Peter saw them all outside, he suddenly went into heaven and locked the door. And so got all the Welshmen out. And you meant to laugh at that. And audiences in uh, Elizabethan London would have uh, laughed out loud at that. And fine, it is, um, you know, we can laugh at it because it's harmless now. Um, at the time, it was basically a form of racism, to be honest. It was ethnic prejudice. Um, and this is, um, you know, without going into um, further detail about this, but hopefully you can start to see um, some of these different threads that I've shown you 
um, about Welsh food and how Welsh food was viewed from the outside as a kind of ethnic marker, um, a clear marker of being Welsh and therefore being different, viewed from England, but also viewed from Germany or France or, you know, those other places, um, and, and kind of exotic. Um, of course, this is how it's always been when Europe colonized Africa and so on. Always, you know, the foods were one of the things that were markers of, you know, being um, African, being, you know, different. Um, and that's, of course, tied into colonialism. Um, it is ridiculous to talk about, um, you know, Wales now being a victim of colonialism. Um, but if you go back hundreds of years, then that is a valid um, lens through which to use. And uh, I think without that lens, it's really hard to understand um, the low status of Welsh food. So this is the point I want to get to. By the time we got to the 20th century, all of these different food traditions, say in the 1950s, 1960s, they were all there. They were all strong. They were present. They were how everybody ate, you know, day in, day out, week in, week out, more or less. Um, uh, and that changed over the second half of the 20th century. And a major reason why it did change so quickly and so thoroughly in Wales compared to other areas of Europe where the traditions were held onto much more strongly is, um, uh, is the, status. Um, the status. It's not the only reason. There are other things. And I go into some of the other um, reasons I think are very relevant uh, in the book. Um, uh, one of them is to do with uh, women, actually, the status of women. Most of Welsh food traditions were absolutely women's traditions. And unfortunately, women had, um, uh, you know, too low a status in Welsh society. Um, and that, that is one of, so there are other things too. I'm not trying to say this is the only reason, but I think it's one clear reason, and it's an interesting one. Um, and, um, uh, and it's actually two women in particular, and I draw attention to them in the book, um, a lady called Bobby Freeman, and the lady called Minwell Tibbet, who did more than anybody else in the 1970s and 1980s to say, wait a moment, we've got these food traditions and they're really interesting. They are really tasty, not all of them, most of them though, they're really tasty. And you know what? They're also really nutritious. These are really nutritious foods. The cockles, the lava, um, these fermented um, you know, oats drinks and so on, they're very good for you. They're not highly processed junk, you know, um, uh, and uh, and it was two women that did more than anybody to to kind of salvage um, what has been um, salvaged. Happily, and uh, I'm not going to talk more about this now, but happily in the book, um, a lot of these traditions, some of them have survived, and I tell those stories where they survived, and some of them died out in the 1970s, 80s, 90s. They're now being brought back and there are people really doing some fantastic stuff to bring these traditions back to life. Um, and uh, there's a lot about that in the book. Um, so, um, so that brings the, the little um, kind of tour into history um, to an end. I want to um, just focus on two or three more foods quite briefly um, to, before I wrap up um, with, some, um, uh, with a conclusion. Uh, firstly, I've already mentioned cockles, um, and uh, and I talk as well about oysters in the book. And uh, what's really interesting um, is that um, oysters and cockles these days are seen um, as kind of oysters in particular as like high status foods that you might eat in a very fancy posh restaurant. Um, but um, historically in Wales, um, it was very much working class food, normal, you know, people's food. They didn't eat chicken. Nobody could afford chicken. Um, very, very infrequently anyway, you know. Um, but oysters, yes, and cockles. And that's survived to the present day with cockles, actually. Cockles are still a working class food um, in Wales. Um, and um, yeah, actually, this is further evidence for what I was telling you a moment ago. Um, oysters in particular came from Milford Haven, from Tenby, from Anglesey, so different parts of the Welsh coast. Um, and there was a massive thing that um, employed hundreds and hundreds of families. Um, and some of these cockles were regarded by people from outside of Wales as the world's largest. Now, whether that's actually true is kind of beside the point. Um, uh, the point is that people thought that they were. Um, but here's what happened. A lot of them were eaten locally by um, normal people. 
The ones that weren't were put in barrels and they were pickled and they were sent out of Wales, from North Wales to Liverpool, from South Wales to Bristol. And then they were sold on for good money. So the Bristol oysters were sold on to the south of England, London, and even to places in um, continental Europe, Holland and Germany. But when they were sold on, were they sold as Welsh oysters or Tendi oysters? No, they were sold as Bristol oysters. Um, they weren't from Bristol at all. You try and grow oysters in the mucky waters where Bristol is, it won't work. You need clean, pure water for oysters. Um, but it shows you the same thing, this low status. Um, uh, and there's a, a very interesting parallel or, or lack of parallel between the story of oysters in Wales and the story of cockles. Oysters were um, over-exploited and all the fisheries collapsed. It's an ecological disaster. This happened in the early 20th century, not that long ago. Cockles, though, they were not over-exploited and there were reasons for this. Uh, you'll have to read the book to get into all the reasons why, because I don't have time to go into it now. Cockles were not over-exploited and People still harvest, as you saw at the beginning, thousands of tons of cockles by hand. The only place in the UK where it still happens by hand, 2022, um, today. Um, and it's uh, you know, a really important um, you know, seafood industry and delicious as well. Um, so the cockle fishery was sustainable and has been for 2,000 years. The oyster fishery was overexploited. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into more of that. Oh yeah, that's a picture. If you haven't seen cockles when they're out of their shells, um, those are couples. I took that picture. Um, uh, yeah, and there are delicious dishes as well that use um, couples, um, but we don't have time to go into that. Um, oats, uh, I'm going to mention very briefly um, uh, this fantastic um, stuff um, around oats. We, I could spend a whole hour just talking about Welsh oat, oat tradition. Um, porridge is an obvious one. Um, but it's by far not the only one. And the top right there, you see um, uh, somebody making um, oat cakes. Um, now, Welsh oat cakes, as you can see, are very large, very thin, and boy, takes a lot of skill to make that sort of thing at home. You try and make um, with oatmeal, a little bit of fat and water and salt, something that is that thin and that large without it just crumbling, it's very difficult. Um, and it, but it was a, a skill. Um, that people valued very highly. Um, and uh, oat cakes were actually, in some parts of the country, eaten more commonly than bread um, into the mid 20th century. And I've met many, many people who grew up um, uh, on oat cakes. Um, now, of course, one of the things, and I, I've kind of already mentioned this in passing, but one of the things about some of the oat traditions um, on the left here, um, the other picture I've got, this thing here. That's an oat dish being prepared, and it's called shumri. Um, there isn't a, an English for it. The English word flummery comes from shumri, but it means something a bit different. It's not the same dish. Um, so this is a fermented oat dish um, that, um, uh, again, it's not made anymore, but it was until the 1960s. Um, and I've met many people, again, who grew up on it. And it's sour, so you stand oatmeal in water for like three days and then the bacteria get going and it makes it sour and then you boil it um, and you stir it with a particular type of um, thing and then and then you take this the, the utfon it's called but it's like a type of wooden spoon out of the um, mixture and when it forms a long tail then you know it's ready you let it cool down and then you serve it when it's cool and you can serve it with well all sorts of things with um, with honey it's nice um, uh, with a bit of milk if you want to. There's lots of things that people did traditionally as well. Uh, and it was a summer dish, a refreshing dish served at harvest time. And people, there are so many traditions and sayings about how um, how nourishing it was in terms of, um, you know, the health of your internal organs. Now, they didn't know anything about science, but they were right. We now know because we know about um, some of the research that's happened in recent years around gut health. So I've got to stop um, there in terms of giving you examples of food, um, but hopefully that has um, both given you some appetite and um, uh, both for real food <laughs> to learn a bit more. Um, so just in terms of a conclusion, um, you know, understanding Welsh food history uh, and, you know, also kind of why it matters. Um, is that the slide I want? I don't think it is. No. Oh, well, I had it on the slide I want. But um, uh, why it matters. Um, 
one is, um, you know, there, there's a massive amount of diversity here. Um, it's not just something really, um, you know, simple and basic, um, and that perception can easily obscure. But those, those are not, I've got the wrong slide on here, my apologies. That isn't what I wanted to share with you. What I wanted to share with you is that, um, uh, is that in an era of climate change, a lot of these foods are local foods that can grow or be produced out of our climate and our land and our shores here. Um, and um, as COVID has shown us, as the Ukraine war has shown us and inflation, um, there's something massive about food security um, there for us here in Wales, but actually also for people in every part of the world to really take seriously. But another thing, um, even more than that, is how hopefully, I haven't made it perhaps um, uh, as obvious as I do in the book, but hopefully I've mentioned enough things in passing to show to you how all these, this different, this wide breadth is really um, kind of tied in to the whole of Welsh culture. I didn't even have time, but there's, there's, you know, there's some poetry there around a dish using cockles. Um, cowl appears in so many um, different literary works. Um, there are so many different folk songs um, to do with orchards and, and other things around food. Um, you know, it's a deep rooted part of Welsh culture in children's literature as well, you know, in the Welsh language. Um, and there's no evidence whatsoever. Um, there's no reason to think that Wales had a kind of puritanical attitude to food in the sense, and by that I mean in the sense that people thought that it wasn't worthy of interest or of celebrating. Actually, if you look into the history and the archives, the opposite is the case. Um, and it's perception, I think, from outside initially, but then I think we Welsh reinforced ourselves that our food wasn't interesting. It wasn't as good as sexy, perhaps, as French food or Italian food or whatever. Actually, a lot of those foods are peasant foods as well, um, and they just valued them, uh, and we perhaps didn't in the way we ought to have done. Um, so thank you um, for um, uh, listening and, and for engaging. Um, I'm looking forward to having questions and a bit of a chat now. The book... Um, is out. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I've got a website, by the way. So if you, I'm writing another book now about the Welsh landscape. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, then I have a website and you can get um, occasional, a very occasional, like two a year emails, maybe three emails um, from me with links to stuff I've written or stuff I've done online. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and just um, put in chat um, two things, um, if I may. One is that um, I'm told that the book is available in Barnes and Noble in the States, which is very interesting. And the other is that um, just today, actually, um, there was a program that went out on BBC Radio 4, which you can get. I think you can get it online from the States, BBC Sounds. Um, anyway, so there's a program um, that went out just today. I put the link in the chat about the shellfish tradition around the UK. And um, they interviewed me for the Welsh um, section of that. Um, and uh, it's quite a, an interesting program um, as well. So that may be interesting. That went out live today on the radio. Um, but great, thank you. And I will shut up there and um, uh, looking forward to questions. Well, I don't know about shutting up. I think um, I would have listened to you for hours. So <laughs> that was fabulous. Um, um, the book is amazing. Uh, another plug for it because um, for some reason, um, I, I, I didn't expect to be as enthralled as I was. I couldn't put it down. And I never thought that wheat especially could be so interesting. <laughs> so it was amazing. So um, uh, open for questions for Karawis. And Dale, I, have one. Down, I have one. I have one. You mentioned orchards. Would the mm -hmm. standard orchards in Wales have been apples, pears? What else could there have been the ancient raspberries i think of them more as bush fruits yeah that's right raspberries are more bush fruits um uh orchards in wales were, were widespread they were grown in every part of the country by every section of society um we lost 97 percent of our orchards wow. in wales oh. between the 1950s and the 1990s so even people today in wales I talk about orchards and people think, no, it was never, there were never orchards in the landscape here, but actually they, they kind of dominated some parts of the landscape. Uh, other, in terms of fruits, apples, um, every part of the country, 
pears, particularly in the southeast of the country, but a lot of pears, native varieties of pears. Um, and the other main one actually was plums. And you'll find ah. plums and damsons. And you'll find that um, in more hilly areas, actually, where pears definitely couldn't grow. People would certainly grow plums and, and damsons. And I'll, the other thing I'll just say briefly about that is um, uh, most of these fruits historically were grown for cooking um, rather than for eating as a kind of table fruit. Yeah. Um, and recently I emailed Susan a link for something called a program country file. Um, if you type it in, it'll come up on the BBC website and they do an awful lot about the history of agriculture agriculture today and conservation history of agriculture they go throughout the british um aisles but a lot of it is welsh and hmm. or they have an hour-long program and one or two vignettes might be Wales. it's fascinating i have a ton of people who are into climate change activism and stuff but when you were talking about the statistics of what's left that we do or don't farm how do we farm it how was it impacted um that is uh, an excellent program so country file all one word it will come up probably with a black banner black and white banner on top that's the bbc navigation page but below that'll be the country file navigation page and you want the programs that say available because most of the others are archived or upcoming they say as soon as they do a program they'll um uh, put it on like this weekend is shooting the states in wales okay thank you thank you luan <laughs> and any other questions yeah i have a question yes uh, margaret here Thank you, Codwin. Uh, it's very interesting, and we're going to get those books this afternoon. We decided. Um, <laughs> I, I had a question about Welsh rare bit mm. because um, I'm a collector of cookbooks and recipes, and I have about 250 cookbooks, especially you know from travels, and I have a bunch from Wales, and, and my family there send me their uh, you know their their fundraiser cookbooks from. I have that book. That's yeah. that's the best one of the Welsh oh, ones. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but my question is, um, I see so many variations on Welsh rare bit. Mm -hmm. It just seems like it's one of those things that everybody has their own idea about how to make Welsh rare bit. Everything from making a sauce that has like beer and mustard in it to simply melting cheese on top of an onion, and it's all called Welsh rare bit. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any comment on that or insight into that? I mean, there's no, you know, there's no doubt that Welsh rarebit started <laughs> off at base. It is roasted cheese on yeah. toast. That mm -hmm. is what it is originally and at root. And if you do that with, you know, um, cheddar cheese, um, uh, you can call it Welsh rarebit. Um, Got it. Recipes that include beer and mustard, you mentioned both of those, um, uh, definitely, um, you know, kind of authentic. Um, okay. With all of these things, when it comes to cookbooks, it's a good thing to bring it up, actually, for everybody's benefit. If you're interested in cooking and, and recipes, this book, it's quite hard to get hold of and probably almost impossible in the States. But actually, some of the recipes are available online. Um, they've been digitized by the National Museum of Wales. Anything in here um, is genuine. It's authentic. Um, uh, whereas you do sometimes see Welsh rarebit recipes where it's basically a chef trying to, you know, uh, do what, you know, just just fancy. follow their fancies. Yeah. yeah. So things with the beer tradition uh, and the mustard tradition, absolutely authentic as well. And they would be later developments from the 18th century onwards of Welsh mm -hmm. rarebit. But absolutely, yes, you can still call that Welsh rarebit. My nine and tide took a, a an onion and on a put an onion on a piece of bread and melted cheese on top and that was yeah. it. And yeah. it was as delicious. Um, yeah. and I have that I have that book you held up. I found it at a used bookshop in Chicago or a dollar wow. nine or something. Right. I love the it. The only the only other thing I'll say about this, this is relevant, is that um the the quality of the ingredients makes all the difference and that's sure. one of the points i wanted to make in the book is that all the ingredients traditionally in all these recipes in welsh cooking 
they were not mass produced. They were yeah. local, high quality ingredients by definition. You know, the bread was home baked, fresh bread with locally grown varieties of wheat. And the cheese yeah. was grown, you know, it was the cows pasture, the sheep up the road. So mm -hmm. if you make Welsh rarebit with cheap supermarket bread and, you know, pretty plasticky cheese, it's would not going to taste very good. No, yeah. But if you use really good quality cheese on a good slice of bread and melt that oh, cheese, <laughs> you're both eating something very similar to what people would have had in Wales traditionally, and you're eating something that's a lot tastier. Yeah. So, so would the cheese... So about, oh, oh mm. sorry. Go ahead. Would the cheese be traditionally what we think of as a cheddar or a carefilly? What would, especially here in the US, yes. what would we look for the best substitute or so, the best one? Had filly, this is a common misconception. Even people in Wales, even chefs think that um, kafili is a, is a very historic, widely made Welsh cheese. Mm -hmm. But kafili doesn't make good Welsh rarebit. Oh. <laughs> Uh, and some modern chefs um, in Wales haven't understood that. Um, uh, <laughs> okay. In Wales, yeah. housewives in Wales, just like they brought the Breton, Breton onions because it was worth it, um, they went out to spend, even if they made kafili cheese at home, they would go out and spend money to buy cheddar cheese okay. from England in order oh. to make Welsh rarebit because oh. cheddar cheese makes better. No! Yes. <laughs> cheddar no. cheese makes much better Welsh rarebit oh, than it does. Melts differently. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I, your book on landscape sounds very interesting and we'll look forward to that. Do you have other plans on the horizon? Because I see you're a bird enthusiast. Maybe a book <laughs> on Welsh birds. <laughs> well, birds come into the book on landscape. So I don't oh, know good. if you've Good, good. I don't know if, if the term rewilding means anything to yes, people in it, North America. So this book is about the whole history of the Welsh landscape, but I'm looking at it from a Welsh cultural point of view, which nobody has done yet. And right, I'm right. going right into the current debates about rewilding and looking at the past to inform the future. Um, and um, I'll give you a sneak peek, but... Um, uh, basically, um, the thing I'm, I'm, I think I'm able to demonstrate, uh, hopefully, um, hopefully quite convincingly, is that um, it doesn't need to be either or. Um, sure. We can have um, we can have uh, farming in Wales and rewilding together, and the key to this actually lies in the history of the landscape. Um, okay. so there's a lot about birds in there, and a lot about trees, and a lot about culture and yeah i've got thirty thousand words to go by easter so you can okay <laughs> we will we'll look forward to it thank you Harwin, my um my sister-in-law lives in dwy um hmm. is head of the um that the forestry project for for the welsh government ah wow so there sure we are yes you, you cover that too i'm sure i i certainly do yes um, um i think there's a question for mari here okay good I, I have a little bit of a strange kind of esoteric question for you, since you are such a scholar of taste and food. I, I wondered after I read, read the book, um, if the palate could be reintroduced or retrained to appreciate Welsh food, since none of us really know it, I I wondered about the reintroduction to to Welsh food and and making us desire it through a, a, a you know through the palate through the taste. Mm. What do you think about that? I think it's a very interesting question, um, and it is def. Yeah, I agree with the premise of the question. So, in other words. I mentioned earlier, um, you know, anybody, when I do talks at groups, I'm, I'm doing a talk on Thursday evening, um, uh, just in the countryside near here. When I do talks in Wales, um, and it's usually older people that have the time to turn up to talks and so on, um, uh, you know, and I ask the audiences, how many of you eat cockles? How many of you grew up on, you know, eat lava bread, these things, you know? And the answer is always 80%, 90%. Mm -hmm. um, but you talk to the younger people and they don't. So that's a palate thing, isn't it? 
Yes. And here, yes. Here's the thing. Definitely. I've mm. had a lot of time and reason to think about this, mm. and uh, and it's really clear with apples as well. Um, the, you know, the, the range of flavors in traditional apple variety is so much bigger than what you get in supermarkets. Um, so here's the thing. I grew up eating cockles, eating lava bread, eating, um, you know, we had cowl a lot. You know, a lot of these foods were just part of my upbringing because that's how mom cooked, because it was how she was raised. And that's just how it was. So mm. my palate from an early age was, you know, that's what it was adapted to. But if you take a, somebody who hasn't is not used to eating shellfish, it yes. is a big, big change. You know, it's not mm. just like chicken. It's it's its own thing. You know, um, lava bread is is, a, is another fantastic example. Lava bread is a very umami flavor. I don't know if you know that term, but you get it a lot in Japanese cooking as well. It's a very savory flavor. It's not strong. It's not spicy mm -hmm. um so it does take mm. a bit of discernment um, and i'll just give a final example of that is for people who grew up eating cow absolutely you know um there's a massive difference between good cow and bad cow um there's you know you you pick out because you're used to it you pick out different nuances of flavor in a really good cow it comes from the fats basically for, from the, the the meat that you're using um, and mm. from the quality of your vegetables and how you prepare it. Um, but it's they're all very umami flavors and, and with a little bit of sweet and a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but they're not strong flavors like spicy food is or like Chinese food, you know? Um, mm. So I would say, um, yeah, these are all, however you look at it, almost all of these dishes and, and so on, um, they're, you know, they're very tasty, but they're not like loud, brash, strong flavors. Mm. They are mm. subtle. And I would actually very deliberately make the comparison with um, Japanese food, just mm. in terms of this. There's lots that's very different, but in terms of the kind of palate, um, yeah, that's what I'd say. Thank you. The, it's just really interesting to hear what you say. Uh, I just wanted to add the other uh, element to this is the sort of imaginative uh, response to lava bread <laughs> you know <laughs> and, and that sort of that sort of sets up uh, also uh, you know a a kind of dismissive quality to mm -hmm. the food and, mm -hmm. and but I, I, but I think it's a training. I do. I, I, I agree with you. I think it's a training of the palate. Um, you know, uh, I you can uh, I took a group of uh, uh, teens to Paris uh, to perform and they had never had snails. And most of yeah. them were like, yeah. you know, they were thinking of the snails in the garden. But yeah. what an amazing surprise when they had them served in the broth and the garlic, and they were absolutely yeah. delicious to them. So I, I, I think that's one of the, inter which you said so clearly, is one of the ways to reintroduce uh, the Welsh palate, the old Welsh palate, to the modern day. I mean, people. some of the... Some of the flavors, um, you know, they are comparable with, you know, with France and with Spain. How do you make food tasty? Well, you add herbs and you add things to flavor. Right. Well, what do people do in Wales? Um, salt, actually, a lot of sea salt um, is one, but also um, parsley, um, you know, um, caraway, um, mm. thyme. Um, you know, these are not, you know, they're not comparable to mm. paprika and chili and, you know, um, turmeric. Um, they're, they're a much more subtle palette. Um, and that's just the way it is. I think you also have to hit the young people today with the idea of the nutritional value. Um, nobody ate seaweed here 10 years ago. Now it's <laughs> everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. Um, and I find that with my younger cousins and younger people throughout family and friends that um, they're looking more for nutrition, and easy, and some of these are easy hits of nutrition, but, um, you know, look at the explosion of oatmeal. I mean, stick it with milk in your microwave overnight and it's ready in the morning, um, you know, uh, that kind of thing. So I think hitting them with 
that type of you can make it easy on yourself, but you can get vast nutritional benefits. Can I jump in, um, a question from um, Christine McSorley? Christine? I just wanted to comment. I wanted to ask first, um, well, first say thank you, Carwin. That was um, very interesting. I look forward to picking up your book. I haven't yet. And the one on apples, because I used to pick apples, cooking apples from my nine's garden and cook with her and make apple chutney. And I cannot find in Canada, I live in Canada, I mm. cannot find a an apple that works the same as the old Bramley, the old cooking apple from my nine street. But yeah. anyhow, I, I'm on a search. So I'm going to look at your book and see if I can find something. But also, do you think when I was growing up in in Wales um, in the 60s, Welsh, the language Welsh was not promoted. It was seen mm. as you needed to be English to get on in the world mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And I really yeah. think... I don't know whether you have any proof on that, whether that happened to the Lopscouse, the Tatus Piminid, yeah. all yeah. those things we ate that my nine made, my yeah. mom yeah. made, I still make, but it wasn't seen as the thing to do because now you needed yeah. to have lasagna and chili and all yeah. these other new things came in. Ooh. So it got put down, played down, because you weren't supposed to be Welsh anymore. You yeah. needed to be more English. So I think that happened. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's what I was, I completely, I think that's what I was trying to say. Maybe I wasn't right. clear enough in the talk. Um, and I was just trying to say that I think that's been happening, not just mm -hmm. in the 20th century, but actually for hundreds of years. Oh, in, for sure. When, the, when the Victorians the stopped us, stopped us speaking Welsh the same yeah. and all that yeah. kind of thing. So yeah. for parents trying to make their children um, get on better it was to not have the Welshness so absolutely you, yeah yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I think that's definitely the case and and you can even see it you know um, <clears throat> those of you I don't but those of you who remember Wales in the in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s um, you know before maybe international cuisine came in um, you know the sorts of things that um, were high status foods were high status English dishes. Yes. And yes. those dishes that you mentioned, like perhaps Piminid and Lobscos and so on, they were only deemed suitable for, you know, um, for eating and serving at home. Um, mm. The idea that you'd, you know, do them for guests or that they would be served in a restaurant or whatever was literally right. laughed at um, mm -hmm. in Wales itself. Um, and like I, I briefly mentioned, Minwell Tibbet, who wrote this book, and Bobby Freeman, who wrote another book I got up there. Um, they were the two women who actually came and said, wait a moment, why can't we serve some of these Welsh dishes? Why can't we have cows on the menu? Um, but they were the first. And that was in um, that was in the early 80s, really. Um, uh, so not all that long ago. But yeah. it's difficult with the like the cowl or lobscouse. There isn't yeah. a specific recipe. It's what your nine did. Yeah. And then your mam made it kind of like your nine but not the same the same yeah. my sister and i both make different lobscouse yeah and, and the thing there and it's is, our twist on it for yeah. our kids as we move you, forward absolutely and you know the thing there is that is just you think of um you know some very well-known french or italian or whatever dishes mm -hmm. um but let's just take the french dish boeuf bourguignon very well-known mm -hmm. dish and um, beef um you know with red wine um you know that kind of stew um well, um, that dish, as it is made in Burgundy, in you know different families that pass on the dish, it has exactly the same range of variation mm -hmm. yeah. as what you're talking about with Lobscouse. That is just the way it is with yes. living kind of peasant dishes. Mm -hmm. um, and it's only when things get you know put in recipe books and put on you know chefs work with them. And the thing with cowl and lobscouse and all these other Welsh dishes as well is until, with basically the exception of Welsh rarebit, um, is that until the late 20th century, none of them really had received that kind of treatment. Um, so, um, so all that, really, what you're saying there, I completely agree. But it's also just a sort of 
a sign of the living nature of the tradition and the authenticity of many of these dishes. Now I'm really sorry. I I remember making Welsh rabbit with my nine yeah. in, a, in, in a saucepan, but do I know what the recipe was? No, I just yeah. made it with her. Now I'm sorry, I don't have that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because my, my nine used to be a cook for a vicar up in Carnarvon. Mm, mm. And she was, so she had all her own little recipes that she never yeah. shared with any of us. No. Nothing's written nothing. down. Yeah. No, no, yeah. not nothing. Uh, not Christmas puddings, I, I now make up remembering. Her taffy yeah. triog, the same, but yeah. I don't have it written down anywhere. That's right. Any, Me neither. Mm. Thank you, Carolyn. Good. Yeah. Christ, any, last, any last questions from anybody? Um, Karen put a link to that BBC program in the chat. Susan, I always find among other Zooms I do, people don't know how to save the chat. If you go to the bottom right of your screen um, and click chat, it will show on the left. And in the bottom right of that, there's three dots. Hit those three dots. It'll say save chat. And then above that, it says show in folder. If you click show in folder, it will show you where on your computer it is going to save it. And then when it comes up, you can right click, go down your um, menu to rename and rename it anything. Um, like I just put it under chat on Welsh food stories instead of the name that comes up. Thank you, Luan. Thank you. Okay. Um... We went over time very happily, um, which is awesome. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, so enjoyable. And um, maybe we can do another one next year on your new book or something. I would love that. Yes. Uh, you have a big Welsh, uh, Welsh audience over here. Um, we've been promoting the book for quite a long time. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, thank you for thank joining you. us, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Great. I have thank the book you. and I'm dying to read it. But my brother stole it from me. So until he's done, um, he took it to Delaware. And until he brings it back, I can't read it. <laughs> Karen, Karen, have you read uh, Landscape and Memory by Simon Shamara, a uh, historian? He, he writes mostly about the Netherlands. But since you're doing landscape, I thought yeah. it might be a very interesting I'm not saying it should influence you or anything, but I thought it might be an interesting uh, thank reference. You. Yeah, yeah. I, it's I'll, called I'll landscape yeah, and you. memory. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Oh, may I may thank I you. add one more thing, Susan? Quickly, when you mentioned um, rewildling, I wasn't familiar with that term, and I recently heard it on a TV show. So I called up my best friend, who's into a natural resources person, and she thought I was staffed. I hadn't heard it. If you go to mapperton.com, it's the biggest state that the American Viscountess and the Earl of Sandwich run. Um, and they are doing a project across their many thousands of acres on rewildling. And it was fascinating the things she was saying. So just mapperton.com and then you can read her menu bars and see how you can get it on YouTube. But um that was very interesting. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, thank you. Okay, everybody. Thank you very much. And um, thank, thank you, Susan. Thank, thank you, Carolyn. Bye. 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 Thank you for your part in this, Susan. Oh, you're welcome. I'm glad everyone enjoyed it. Um, we loved it. it. We loved the, it. Um, the uh, 